Okay, welcome everyone um, and thank you for joining the fifth webinar in our MTW Expansion Flexibility 2 cohort onboarding series. I'm Andalyn Nesbitt Rodriguez and I'm happy to be here with you today serving as your MC for this session. Next slide please. All right, we have a lot to cover in today's webinar. Um, so at the first MTW Supplement webinar, we talked about what is required in the MTW Supplement. Today, we're going to go through each step in the process and discuss the how. We'll remind you about the things that will be required for the MTW Supplement. We're going to talk uh, more about the public engagement process, um, including um, we're going to hear uh, from a voice of experience um, on this topic. We're also going to provide some concrete examples for how to strengthen your MTW Supplement text to help it sail through the review process. We're going to highlight some common issues and mistakes that, that agencies have uh, that have gone before have made um, with ideas about how you can avoid those pitfalls. Um, the exclamation point icon that you see here on this screen highlights the things that you're going to want to be on the lookout for. Um, and we're going to flag where you need to create documents to attach to the MTW supplement submission. So you'll see the icon for attaching a document where those attachments are needed. We're going to talk about the um, submitting the MTW supplement and the online system, and we're going to um, share resources to help you successfully complete the MTW supplement. So, as usual, we're going to pause um, for questions throughout the presentation. We're also going to do a few quick knowledge checks um, and we're going to have a few few poll questions um, today. So please do participate. We want this to be a really um, robust conversation between all of us. Um, please feel free to enter your questions into the chat along and along. We'll um, stop and answer those um, as we go. Um, and when we do have poll questions or, or questions and we ask you to put some of those in the chat, please do uh, participate. All right, and with that, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Autumn. Hello, everybody. I'm Autumn Gold and I am with the MTW team. So we're going to start off with a few MTW supplement reminders. Uh, notice the exclamation point at the top. These are all points that can trip an agency up. And so we want to give you fair warning. The MTW supplement is a supplement to the PHA plan. So this MTW supplement and the PHA plan go hand in hand. You'll submit the PHA plan as you always have. Um, qualified PHAs do not submit an annual PHA plan, but when becoming an MTW agency, um, that doesn't change. You still don't have to submit an annual PHA plan, but MTW agencies must always submit the supplement to the PHA plan annually, even if you do not have new activities or waivers. Uh, so qualified agencies will submit annually. Um, You'll submit the PHA plan along with the supplement at the same time. The supplement is part of the plan and they're submitted together. Um, we know one, the PHA plan goes into either directly to your field office or it goes through the portal and the supplement goes to the online system in HIP. We know that's not ideal um, at this time. We're working on it and um, but we'll discuss the online system more later in this webinar. So be sure not to submit the MTW supplement until you submit your PHA plan. Always submit the supplement no later than 75 days um, prior to the agency's fiscal year, just like you do with the PHA plan. Um, for this first submission year, um, it can be a little tricky. So there's two options. You can submit your next PHA plan um, on its due date with the supplement, or if you have an existing PHA plan in place, you can do an amendment to that PHA plan and include your supplement. That does mean you have to, to do an amendment of the PHA plan and go back out to public comment for both the plan and the supplement. A few more reminders. Um, you need to wait for approval from HUD. You'll receive a letter from the field office before you implement any activities. For special waivers, which are the agency specific and safe harbor waivers, um, we those may not be approved immediately and may require more review by HUD. So you will get a conditional letter saying you can move forward with your PHA plan and your MTW waivers, but you'll have to wait for uh, 
a second letter for approval of those special waivers. The field office will let you know when there's a decision about those waivers that you've requested or if there's further information required from you. If there's any updates or corrections or comments that HUD has made, um, there may be times that you need to resubmit. Once the MTW supplement is approved and you receive that letter from HUD from the field office, then you can finalize your policies and you'll be able to proceed with implementing your activities. We'll talk more a little bit later in the presentation about how um, the process for updating your policies and the timing in relationship to approving your supplement. Just a reminder um, that the MTW operation is always your first resource. Uh, bookmark it on your desktop, print it, have it easily accessible to you, get familiar with it, uh, read through it, highlight it, um, and you need to refer to it as early and often as possible. Um, pay specific attention to Appendix 1, which describes all the MTW waivers and the associated activities um, within the safe harbors, which agencies will be using as the basis for the MTW supplement content, especially in the first year. Um, and I'll just pause here and say, um, there are 17 um, waivers in the Appendix 1 and 70 some activities. Just do a few at a time. Build, just pick out, you know, four or five that you want to do, three to five that you want to do the first year. Get good at those and then try uh, to do something a little more complicated. Um, you'll also want to uh, refer to Appendix 2 in the Operations Notice. Um, it gives you uh, information on how to conduct your impact analysis and create your hardship policies uh, uh, when those are required um, as part of the process. Also, I'd like to um, highlight Section 7, um, the MTW supplement to the PHA plan addresses the requirements around the timing for submitting your supplement and the required public process that, uh, that we'll be talking about later as well. Throughout the webinar, uh, we will be go being ask asking you a few quick questions, uh, key points that we want sure to make sure everybody remembers as they walk through this webinar today. They're not meant to be hard or tricky. They're just um, trying to help us uh, make sure that you have key takeaways in the midst of all of this information. Uh, so, Sean, if you would pull up or I'll just, it's not a poll, I'll just say the question. Uh, question number one, um, what resource should you turn first to for reference in regard to all things MTW? So please put your answers in the chat box. Um, we, we talked about the operations notice, the different parts of the operations notice, appendix one, appendix two, um, and section seven. And so I see in the chat, people have said the operations notice, and that is exactly right. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so the MTW process um, is really a process. Um, there's many steps to it. it. It's important that you do things in the, in the correct order um, to ensure that you have a successful supplement. So let's take a high level look at the steps in the process for creating your supplement and, and getting it approved. Uh, for now, we're going to take, uh, walk through the process of gaining HUD approval of this supplement form and be, from beginning to end and uh, highlight a few key points. The first point is uh, public engagement. It's probably the most important piece of this. You wanna engage your interested parties, your families, your community, your nonprofit partners, your, your stakeholders, um, everybody that you can think of that will be impacted by um, the activities that you implement. And as we noted before, this engagement will continue throughout all of the steps. You don't wanna just stop um, at, the, you know, at the public hearing. You wanna engage your, your interested parties before, during, and after the process. Um, it'll be important to uh, collaborate with your stakeholders, with your interested parties, 
um, for your special waivers and activities. Um, you'll want to provide them information and gather information that will inform your goals and, and help you draft your supplement. The selected waivers and activities, as you know, the goals that you set for your agency will guide these activities that you undertake and ultimately the waivers that you're going to select. For the impact analysis, as a reminder, um, you will want to examine the intended and unintended impacts and consequences of the changes um, that you could possibly result from your MTW activities. The activities that you choose and the waivers that you select along with the results um, of when you do your impact analysis will lead you towards the necessary hardship policies that you need to create. So the hardship policies, you want to think about uh, the negative impacts that these activities may have on some of the residents or all of the residents. Um, either you'll gain this information from your doing your impact analysis and most likely just from your careful thought about each activity. Ensure that these policies are addressed and how the agency will determine uh, if an MTW agency constitutes a hardship and be clear about what the agency is gonna do to provide immediate relief to the families. As for completing the MTW supplement form, once you've finalized your MTW supplement content, including all of your documentation, then you're ready to complete the online, the web-based MTW form. We're going to talk more about what it takes to complete this MTW form later in the webinar. And we're going to talk more about what um, the steps that you have to take um, for the public engagement, goal setting, uh, waiver choices, activities, the impact analysis, the hardship policy, though all of those are going to be folded into your MTW supplement. And how to gain HUD's approval, which is most important, right? Uh, the HUD field office will review your supplement and email you with questions and comments and concerns if you need any changes. And the supplement that you've submitted through the online form will be returned to you for revision so you can make those updates. Later, we'll talk about best practices for developing the supplement document that'll help you get um, your supplement approved quickly. And we'll go over some tips for making revisions as well. Um, now we'll do a poll uh, to get a better sense of what you're thinking and the pieces in the process that you might be concerned about. Um, we know this can be overwhelming. So, Sean, poll question number one. Okay, which of the steps in the MTW process do you have concerns about? Uh, the public engagement, col collaborating to, to set your goals, special waivers, the impact analysis, hardship policies, completing the form, gaining approval, updating your policies or other. Um, and please don't forget to select and then you have down in the right hand corner, uh, you need to submit the or uh, hit the submit button. So we'll give you a few minutes to answer. We can probably close the poll now. Oh, okay. Um, some of you said public engagement, some said impact analysis, gaming HUD's approval, and others just said no answer. Um, would anybody like to come off chat and explain or or ask your question directly so you can elaborate? And if not, that's okay too. Okay. Uh, let's go on to public engagement. So today we're going to point out some of the places that MTW agencies from the prior cohorts have run into difficulties and challenges and give you some helpful tips, uh, tips to avoid those pitfalls. First, it's important to establish trust 
by notifying your families of what the PHA is proposing to do under the MTW program. Remember that engaging effectively with your staff and your community um, and your partners is a huge part of this. Communicating well and building their trust throughout the, the process um, is very essential. A key component of the public engagement process is to involve both your, your public housing residents and your housing choice voucher residents. Uh, you can do this through your resident advisory board or through your tenant association. Um, and I'm highlighting this. Um, if your agency does not have a resident advisory board, it's really important that you establish one as soon as possible. The RAB uh, engagement is important is a very important part of the process. It helps you ensure that the program participants have a meaningful and opportunity to partic participate in the decisions that directly impact them. Um, I know that when you do your PHA plan, you put it out uh, for public comment, you have it posted, you have a hearing, nobody shows up and you just move on. That's really not okay with MTW. You need to go the extra mile to ensure that your residents uh, and your interested parties are included in this process. It's important to educate all parties by holding a minimum of at least two meetings, resident meetings as a best practice. These meetings must be held in addition to and prior to your public hearing. The input from the public should ultimately inform your MTW program and the activities that you choose and what goes into your supplement. Be sure to publish, publish the notice for your public hearing and make the PHA plan and the MTW supplement uh, available at the same time. Um, remember, they go hand in hand. And as you make information public um, and available, it's important to develop a draft of the MTW supplement. We recommend that you use the OM be approved version of the HUD form 50075, um, the PDF version um, in your planning. And that form number is actually the MTW supplement. But don't try to use the online system tool at first. Really use that form um, as your planning tool. Review the PDF version, talk to your residents, um, talk to your community, talk to your partners and develop your narrative and your supporting documentation before you ever go into the system. Um, the HUD MTW supplement form is really your one-stop shop um, for gathering all the information you need when you're ready to complete that supplement online. So once you have all of that information, you go through that whole supplement process that we talked about, then you'll want to put the information online. You, um, just like your a PHA plan, you're going to hold a 45 day public comment review, which begins prior to the public hearing. Uh, the PHA plan and the supplement and all of your supporting documents must be available for inspection and review by the public um, and are part of um, an imperative as a part of the public engagement process. Remember that you must hold at least one public or you must hold the public hearing to discuss the draft of the supplement. Come prepared, bring that draft that you, you did in the PDF version, um, draft your impact analysis, have your hardship policies ready, um, and they must be ready and, and out for public um, review before your public hearing. The feedback that you gather during that hearing will help update those drafts. So you'll take their feedback and you'll go back and do edits to your plan. So really think about and be able to speak to those documents during your public hearing. Again, remember to record all comments and your responses to those comments. These comments must be submitted along with the agency's description of how they were considered and how you responded to them. So that's a separate document that will be uploaded into HIP. We suggest reviewing um, the, the getting buy-in uh, portion of the MTW online manual. It's really cool. I highly recommend it. Um, it's incredibly important part of the, the public engagement process. Um, okay, let's just go to the next slide. Public engagement 
continued. Um, here is the first document that you're going to need to develop to upload into the system and include as an attachment um, when making your online submission. This document will provide the public comments received, how you analyze them, and the comments um, in addition to your comments describing the decisions you made in response to those comments. So you'll put um, what the comment was, how you analyzed it, and then how you responded to it. And that will be part of your MTW supplement as a supporting document. The, the comments received by the public and the resident advisory board, the tenant association must be submitted by the MTW agency. Um, and as I said, um, how the, those comments were considered. Uh, you must also submit the comments and the responses for all of your safe harbor and your agency specific waivers, which are to be held at an additional public um, public meeting. So you can schedule your um, original public meeting for your MTW supplement and your PHA plan. And right after that, you can ha hold your additional public comment or public meeting that you wanna discuss any special waivers that you have those um, agency specific waivers and those safe harbor waivers. Please note that the required number of hearing really depends on the safe harbor and agency specific waivers being requested. When these special waivers are requested, you must hold a separate public hearing to discuss the particular waivers. You really wanna give them enough time um, so that um, your audience can ask you questions. And in addition to the public hearing, that must be held as part of the PHA plan process. Um, so, like I said, you can have hold your your original public process meeting and then have the separate one right after that. Okay, next slide, please. Um, so, the PHA plan and the supplement to the PHA plan and the timeline, um, because you're it's a supplement to the PHA timeline. You already know your timeline very well for your PHA plan and how you have to back into that. So let's now talk about the PHA plan and the supplement to the PHA plan. You will want to plan carefully and establish a schedule um, to the MTW supplement and, and its completion. This can be done congru congruently at the same time as your annual plan, which is 75 days before the fiscal beginning. It's the same process um, that you do with your PHA plan, um, which it, but also includes more public engagement and additional public hearings. The PHA plan schedule for developing the supplement must be built in sufficient and give yourself sufficient time. When drafting the PHA plan and the supplement and all the supporting documents, including the required impact analysis and hardship policy, and giving yourself time to update your policies based on your proposed activities. Be sure to publish the notice and hearing and make it available um, for the public to review at the same time. You'll need to obtain board approval of the plan, the supplement and your policies, and you will submit the plan and the supplement for HUD approval. Once you've received your PHA plan and the supplement approval, the, the official letter that you get from the field office you can then finalize and update your policies in your admin plan in your ACOP, and then you can move forward in implementing those activities. Next slide. Okay. Uh, timing of the admin plan in ACOP. Um, I think we tripped a few people up before, so we just wanna spend some time on the timing of this. You combine your annual plan process with your um, admin plan and your ACOP approval. You must update your, your policies to be consistent with any activities and related, acti ac related waivers that you request. You cannot implement any activity or waiver until you receive HUD approval and the relevant sections of your policies um, have been updated. This means that you wanna use one of the PHA plan templates that you're used to that is appropriate for your PHA plan. And um, there's a website here 
to where you can go and get those, but I'm, I'm sure you already know which template you use. Um, and if you intend to undertake any MTW activities, any MTW waivers, safe harbor waivers, agency specific waivers, in all of those activities that you're planning to undertake, you want to put those in your PHA plan so that the supplement ties back to your PHA plan. If you're a small qualified PHA plan, PHA, um, you don't have to submit the annual plan, as I mentioned before, but you do have to submit your supplement annually. You'll want to consider all of your policy updates to, in, to incorporate into your admin plan and your ACOP. So what activities did you choose? Um, specifically, any hardship policies that you have, you want to incorporate those into your policies. Um, you want to propose these changes. We recommend that you use a red line version. Um, you take your policies as is right now. You add in any policies you want using a red line version um, for those that are being uh, proposed. You can include language that states the proposed policies are, are pending approval of the MTW plan and will be effective as soon as it's approved. The PHA provides a copy to their board and posts a copy for the 45 day notice comment period. Again, a qualified PHA can um, deliver or, you know, deliver personally or mail to their participants and post in at least three places um, in, and in the building about this. And then finally, you, you obtain the board approval um, to implement those policies to be effective as the date of the approval of the PHA plan and the supplement. All right, so the timing and key takeaways. The MTW supplement process will take approximately six months, very if you want it to run smoothly, so you incorporate it into your PHA um, process, but remember you're gonna do more public engagement than you're used to with just the PHA plan. And if, if you take that six months, um, it should all go fairly smoothly. Submission times must be um, congruent with the annual plan, submitted at the same time, even if they're going into two different places um, and as an amendment to the existing. So you can either do it um, when you're through your PHA plan process, or you can amend your PHA plan and add your supplement into that. There are, uh, may be various timing issues when submitting your first supplement. And as I shared before, you can either wait for your next annual submission, which is completely fine, we're not rushing you. We want you to take your time. Or if you're eager to get started, you can submit an amendment taking both the PHA plan and the supplement back out for public comment. Um, it, we encourage you to talk to your field office about where things are with your agency, where you are in the process to avoid any confusion about the process. And at this time, uh, I would, I'm happy and honored to in, introduce Lindsay the MTW Hi. coordinator. Uh, Hi, Autumn. Excuse yes. me, sorry for interrupting. We have a question in the chat that's really relevant to what you were just talking about. So oh, I just well, want to jump in okay, here. Um, and thank you so much for putting your question in the chat. Um, so just to confirm, we can't have one long public meeting to cover both the PHA plan and the MTW supplement, the waivers. We need two separate public hearings. You do need two separate public hearings, but one can happen right after the other one, so it can feel like a really long meeting. And one is to cover the PHA plan, and one is to discuss the uh, actual Absolutely. safe harbor or agency-specific waivers. Yes. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. Okay, now I'd like to hand it over to Lindsay, the MTW coordinator with the Akron Housing Authority. Uh, she's going to talk about her experience with the public process. Great, thank you, Autumn. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Nice to see you um, virtually and meet you. Hope to see you in person um, someday in the future as we all work together um, in this process. Um, as Autumn said, I am from the Housing Authority in Akron, Ohio. And Sean, if you can go to the next slide, it gives a quick overview of our Housing Authority. Um, as you can see, we have about 11,000 units, so we do just qualify as a large Housing Authority. Um, but I think the things that I'll mention today can easily be adapted to um, your size housing authority and for what your needs are. We joined the MTW expansion program in 2021, and we are part of cohort two, the stepped and tiered rent demonstration. 
Next slide, please. So I'm gonna start talking about even before your public process period begins. So where you are now, you don't have a supplement in yet, um, you can already be having that public conversation. So it's really important, I think, especially in year one, as you're thinking um, of what waivers you wanna go for first, but also down the road as you kind of shape in future years, what direction your housing authority is going to go into. MTW is a great way to really rethink and revamp um, the entire housing authority. And so the more we reach out, um, the more community buy-in we have in that new direction that we all wanna go. So first of all, reach out. If you already have ideas of waivers that you're thinking of, um, ask yourself who might those waivers impact? Who might have already thought about this? Uh, and reach out to them early on. And then also talk to them to generate new ideas, things that you haven't thought about yet, your staff hasn't thought about yet, um, the public, your uh, other interested parties, your participants, all are thinking of ways to improve the housing authority or what's a, tr a trouble or a problem for them as it is. So here's a list of some of those that we currently involve in our process. Um, of course, the resident advisory board, as Autumn mentioned before, is an important uh, party in your conversation as far as what waivers you wanna apply for. We also did surveys for participants, our landlords and our staff. We sent out three separate surveys uh, via email just using SurveyMonkey, so very cost efficient, um, to find out from them what their opinions were. So we did some leading questions, like what would incentivize landlords to join the Housing Choice Voucher Program? program. Gave them a few choices of things that we were already considering going after in terms of waivers. And then based on their feedback, we kind of ranked in priority, which were the most important, what people saw as being effective tools, and used that to determine which waivers we actually went for. We also left openings in these surveys for other as a response to get their general feedback or ask some open-ended questions like, what problems do you see with the housing authority? What do you wish we could change or improve? And then we use those to review what could be um, edited and applied to our supplement um, to ask HUD for a waiver related to that. We also have a staff committee that meets monthly. For us, this is supervisor level. Um, for you, it might be your whole staff, whatever makes the most sense. And we talk about uh, what waivers we want to apply for in the future, how the current waivers are going, what might need to be tweaked the next year in our supplement that we need to change, what are the problems up that might need a waiver, and just have that continual conversation with those key staff members. We also have done a lot with broader staff. Uh, so early on when we first joined MTW, I attended a lot of staff meetings with different groups. And again, we have a, a bigger agency just to let them know, you know what MTW was, for us, what tiered rent was, what we were thinking of doing with this new flexibility, and then to really ask them, what are your general ideas? What do you think we should change? What are your feelings on some ideas we were already kind of throwing around? And to have that conversation with um, the upper level of the agency, but also our entry level staff, so that everybody had a chance to have a voice in the direction that we chose to go in. And the last one I listed here is an MTW advisory committee. This has just been a great resource for our agency we formed this committee uh, as we were applying for MTW to get feedback, and we've continued with them ever since. We meet with them quarterly. We have our local fair housing. We have a behavioral health center we do a lot of work with, our largest public school system in our jurisdiction, our job and family services, um, our local urban league. We have public housing and housing choice voucher residents, um, and we also have a landlord from the housing choice voucher program. And so not all of them make it every time, but they, we share ideas with them ahead of time. We take their feedback. They have a voice for any concern they might have uh, with our staff members. So, for instance, we were trying um, to apply for a waiver this year about uh, some self-certifying for landlords on inspections, and we got a lot of pushback from this committee, just a lot of concerns. And so we stepped back and said, we're going to hold off on that idea. We'll relook at it for the next year in a way that might meet their concerns, but still meet our need for administrative efficiency. Um, and so there's a really good conversation going with them over time. Uh, next slide, please. So as far as timing for getting public feedback, it's never too early to start. As Autumn was saying, the process really is so long. Um, it's never too late to ask for more feedback. So you have your main public comment period time, but you can start gathering all that feedback right now as you're tossing around ideas and just record information that's shared with you um, during meetings, during conversations, and kind of start that public comment um, submission even earlier. 
Uh, as far as meetings, we do monthly meetings for our staff committee and quarterly for MTW advisory committee, whatever would work for you just to have that going. We don't talk with them just right before public comment period or just during public comment period. It's a year round ongoing. We know it's coming. We know it's happening. There's a guaranteed space to share our ideas and to receive feedback. Also, I would suggest keeping records for future waiver requests. <clears throat> I know Autumn said maybe three to five waivers your first year. Um, but if you're gathering a lot of information early on, we have, I don't know, a list of maybe 60 waivers right now that we kind of keep on the back burner. And so each year when it's time for us to decide which waivers to apply for, we refer back to that list and see what's feasible. So an idea might have come to us in 2021 and 2022, and that's our first supplement and we couldn't do it, not gonna happen. But in 2026, maybe we have the staff capacity or the MTW knowledge or the money to do it. And so it becomes reasonable down the line. With those records, we also keep who gave us that idea. So we can come back later. If we need more information um, and it came from a staff member, we can go ask them. Or maybe it came from a housing choice voucher participant. We can share back later, hey, this idea came from a participant and now we're implementing it um, to really show that we're listening to that feedback that we receive and we're utilizing it um, in our supplement ideas. When you're thinking of public process, the three keywords that I picked for it were education, communication, and presentation. So there's a lot of educating to be done with MTW. Uh, the housing authority, the way we operate is already confusing for those, especially outside, sometimes inside our organizations. And now we're kind of flipping the script with MTW. Some of the rules go out the window and there's new rules and new things to worry about. So really explaining what that means, why your housing authority is doing it, and what your goals are for these new waivers. Why are you changing the old rules? And the more we educate, people can understand and give that valuable feedback. Then of course, the communicating is not just us talking, but also receiving that from the interested parties that we're talking to. So we offer opportunities to receive that. And as far as presentation, giving the information and receiving the feedback in multiple ways. So we get that information by sending mailers, using our website, meetings, of course. We do mass text messaging and emails to our residents, to landlords. And then we also receive feedback. Um, we have a separate dedicated MTW voicemail phone line, an MTW email address that can send information and questions and comments to. We've done surveys, as I mentioned, course written comments, and then comments during meetings to make sure we're really getting a holistic picture and offer opportunities to everybody involved. Next slide, please. And then during your actual public process time, so during that 45 day window, notify everybody you can that you think might be interested so you can really get that good, good feedback. Um, something we do to cut back on costs is we make up little flyers and send them in mailers that are already going out. So if a rent statement letter is going out, an inspection notice goes out, a hat contract, we're putting the flyer in there. So that's another reminder um, to anybody who might have an opinion. Hey, we're having a public meeting, please come. Here's how to submit a written comment if you can't come. Um, we also put up flyers at our public housing properties. Of course, a public notice in the paper. Um, we also use our website. We have separate MTW pages and an annual plan page. People can always go to the same page and see the updated information from year to year. We have a landlord portal through our software vendor that is a free part of our software. Um, we put up announcements on there. We have a Facebook page. We put it out on the Facebook page. Just new ways to invite discussion um, and reach out to people. Offer multiple options if you're able to. A virtual meeting, an in-person meeting, the written comments, commenting ahead of time. Um, we also offer separate meetings sometimes. So we have uh, a great fair housing and legal aid uh, community involvement. And so we actually meet with them separately during the public process period, rather than having them come to our regular public hearing, their questions are usually more specific. So we have a set time we meet with them every year to discuss the MTW supplement, as well as our annual plan items. Um, so they have a chance to really voice their concerns and then leave the other meetings open to residents, participants, landlords, um, other groups. Uh, as Autumn mentioned, one great tip is you have to have these separate meetings for your agency specific or safe harbor uh, waivers. Do those back to back to keep your attendance up. So you try and have someone come on Monday and then come back on Friday, you're gonna lose a lot of people. 
And a lot of your waivers are going to be so interconnected that the whole picture of what your agency is doing is dependent on those regular pre-approved waivers, but also these agency specific ones. And so doing those back to back um, is really helpful. At those meetings, have the right staff there to answer the questions. People that come, they wanna see that you are invested. They wanna get their questions and concerns answered then. Um, the more we can do that, it does keep that conversation going um, year round. And then finally, create a timeline to keep track of all of the dates involved. Um, as Autumn mentioned, some dates line up with your annual plan, but there are a lot of internal items to keep track of. The meetings, the feedback, um, getting your supplement ready for public posting takes a lot of time and can have some IT issues. Um, so really having all of that laid out, we have a two page word document that we use each year um, that we just update the dates on for the new year. So you make sure you don't miss any of the steps involved. And especially if you're one of the qualified PHAs, not doing the usual annual plan process every year, um, it's that much more important to get those dates down to know, uh, kind of back out of when your due date is to know when you need to do the different steps of the process. And next slide, please. This is just my quick uh, summary slide. Ask multiple groups in multiple ways to get the most information that you possibly can. Keep the conversation going throughout the year. Uh, for example, right now we are in our public comment period for our 2025 supplement. I'm already researching a waiver for 2026 that I know that our executive director is interested in. And so I'm gathering information now. So as soon as I can have those conversations with our interested parties, uh, with our staff members, I can start getting feedback early on, make those tweaks, reach out to other housing authorities. Um, and I've got time to do that. So I'm already starting on it right now. And then finally, make sure there is back and forth communication that you are putting out the info, but you're also taking back in that feedback and then sharing back to them um, how you've used it. People feel a lot more valued, I think, as we all do, when they see you've taken their comment to heart, you've used it for something, not just writing it off. Um, the more we show that, the more investment for future years we're going to have. And that is my last bit of information. I think the next slide is open for questions, if anybody has any. Um, and my email address also is on my first slide. If you think of things later, you have questions, please feel free to reach out anytime. All right, thank you so much, Lindsay. Um, yes, I want to to open the floor and make sure that we um, have the opportunity to ask Lindsay any questions. There is a question um, in the chat um, that was put in there right before Lindsay started talking, and we're definitely going to get to that. Um, but also, want to go ahead and ask Lindsay any questions now. So. You can put your question in the chat or you can simply come off mute and, and ask your question if anyone has any questions for Lindsay. I think that you gave a ton of really great information, Lindsay. Um, and one thing that I really appreciated was the education, communication, and presentation um, part of it. And you gave some really good tips and tricks about that. Um, so when it came to presentation, you said offer information and receive feedback in multiple methods, multiple mediums, right? So I have a question for the group um, now, and if you can, please put your um, answers to this question in the chat. Um, so uh, regarding the presentation, what methods will you likely use or have you used in the past that have been good to notify participants or other interested parties? What methods will you likely use in your own public uh, public engagement? If you could put your answers in the chat. Or come off mute if anybody wants to wants to talk. Thank you so much, Kelly. Text and email along with posting notices on properties. Yep. Yes, and now going to try surveys. I think that was a really good, um, good suggestion there. Great, we got a few people saying kind of the same there. I thought, yeah, some things that I had not thought of before was an MTW phone line and email address. That's a really, really great, uh, great place. People can just reach out directly. Surveys was really good. Um, we also, you know, PSAs on local television stations or local radios, mm -hmm. public service announcements are really good. Um, flyers, social media announcements. Um, these days, social media is really 
a great way to reach out to folks. Um, resident advisory board meetings, um, and you had mentioned comments, of course, that people provide during meetings. Um, and discussions with key influencers, key key residents that have the ears of, of their fellow residents um, and can spread the word there as well. Um, Jill says postcard mailing, attempting to get involvement in RAB, very good, um, and loves the idea of quick surveys as well. So there's a lot of information there, a lot of good ways that we just listed to reach out and make your public engagement really, really um, meaningful and robust. So, all right, um, at this time, um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, turn it over to, um, actually, we have one more poll question. Ah, here we go. There is a question in the chat. I don't want to, Stacey, I'm not going to forget you. Um, there was a question in the chat, and um, though it was answered, um, I do think that it's helpful for others, so I want to get to that as well. So for the uh, 1231 PHAs, if we have assigned ACC, but we don't have enough time to complete the supplement in time, can we still um, submit an amendment to the annual plan at a later time without any problems? And Crystal or Autumn, I'm not sure which one of you wants to take that. Yeah, so the answer is yes. Um, so you can um, amend your PHA plan that will include your supplement and hold all of the same um, public um, hearings that you would um, your initial one and then if you have any special waivers. So yes, we encourage you to do an amendment if you feel ready to go and you don't want to wait a whole another year. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you so much. Thank you to everybody who participated just then. That's great. Be sure to continue putting your questions in the chat. Um, at this time, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Crystal, uh, who's going to talk a little bit about uh, waivers and, and MTW supplement narratives. Crystal? Hello, everybody. All right. So happy that everybody could join us. Uh, Crystal Mills on the MTW team. We can go ahead and go to the next slide. going to try to take a deeper dive into kind of the meat of what you all will be working on, right? Um, we've given you a lot of definitions and things to discuss, and now we wanna talk about, well, like, where do we get started? Um, I wanna also give a quick shout out to Lindsay before she has to hop off and who's left her email, but thank you for providing that hands-on experience because we all at the MTW office at HUD can discuss with you about selecting waivers, but it's nothing like reaching out um, collaboratively and to your peers about well, what did they learn when they were thinking about uh, getting started and what waivers to select. But to kind of reiterate what we've already said, like once you have your goals in mind, you need to figure out concretely, like now, what do you need to achieve those same goals, right? Spend some time really envisioning the activities you would need to undertake to achieve those goals. And then pick a set of activities that will help you move towards those same goals, right? Um, choose a set of activities that is manageable enough to implement successfully and see some short term successes. So it's good to think about the big picture, but also take your time. We just can't say this enough. Don't try to take on too many activities in the first year. Set yourself up for success. Um, as you start as you know, with your initial MTW activities by taking on a few selected meaningful activities, you want your early activities to help you gain momentum and to earn the confidence for your staff and your residents and your community. So they can kind of acclimate to what you all are planning on doing and not all of your initiatives will require waivers, but of course, some do. Okay, so, and, and there are 2 places that you can find the MTW waivers and other say uh, MTW waivers available to your agency. Okay, the 1st is appendix 1 of the operations notice, um, either in the official federal register version or the reader friendly version, which are both linked right here on the slide. Um, appendix 1 of the operations notice will just give you everything that we kind of highlighted in last last uh, training, just kind of showing you the format. And uh, we will continue to talk to you about those, but also if you have any questions, again, I know we said this, but we want you to be involved. Please ask those in the chat. Even today is applicable, is, is fine as well. Um, and here's a tip for each of the MTW activities that you'll find in Appendix 1. 
look closely also at those safe harbors, okay? This is an area where we see a lot of agencies making mistakes, so watch carefully for those safe harbors. And we'll take a deeper dive. I'm gonna show you guys kind of when you're looking at writing out your activities or selecting which waivers that you wanna implement and explaining the narrative, explaining to HUD what you're wanting to do, then I think as a best practice, taking a look at the description, the safe harbors and those parameters to help you better describe what you're wanting to do. So we'll take a look at best practices with those later as well. Um, there's a lot you can do with the the waivers. It's actually 17 MTW waivers and focus, focusing on those in the first year will help you to get off to a strong start, I believe. Okay. Um, remember that in the last webinar, we also suggested a, a few waivers that you may want to consider that are low hanging fruit. So not difficult to set up and, uh, you know, implement it uh, frequently from other agencies that are already come on board, such as elimination of deduction, standard deduction, payment standards based on small area FMRs or FMRs, and also alternative re-exam schedules. So if you want to apply for any, let's say, agency-specific waivers or safe harbor waivers, if you find that's needed, there's also a link here on the slide about that process, because it is a lengthy process. Um, but, you know, we're, MTW is kind of made of that flexibility, so you'll just want to be very thorough in the description, right, and include appropriate citations throughout. Um, this will also ensure that there's no delays in your review process. So if you're planning on an agency-specific or safe harbor waiver, um, just make sure that you still, as Autumn mentioned, like, look at that operations notice, okay? That is where the requirements for the submissions, that's where they're located. And you can also find uh, helpful information in the summary of those requirements in the online manual. Uh, so that online manual is linked here on the slide, safe harbor and agency specific waiver request process. And um, also remember some goals can be achieved without those, without those special waivers. That's one of the wonderful things about the MTW program is that it, we encourage people to use their imaginations about what is possible and once you do that, you can come up with activities that your agency could have done, you know, all along, but now you have this unique flexibility. So uh, that a lot of other MTW agencies have already found out about. Next slide. Okay, so I'm talking about the tips for writing a strong MTW supplement narrative. Okay, so throughout this and the next slides, we're going to kind of go through some befores and some afters because we, we really want to get a, the message over and convey to you and we want you to be able to convey to HUD and your public clearly about what it is that you're seeking to do. And, you know, we would like for you to be approved as quickly as possible once you submit it into HUD as well. So we feel like this of all the trainings, this piece of it really stands out. We've heard from previous in previous cohorts and previous uh, from previous agencies that this really helped. So even now, as we talk about it, please continue to reference back to these slides because um, we're going to show you some tips here about how to make it happen. So these examples are based on weaknesses. We have seen in MTW supplements submissions before from earlier cohorts. There's no rocket science here on the examples, but we'll hopefully clearly explain some basics that you should consider upon your review and as you're writing out for your narratives. Um, so you want to be able to clearly identify what you plan to do, what you're going to, to use to do it, um, how you're going to do it, and what makes it a good idea. Okay, so this slide here shows you some of the most common areas that we see below uh, in these columns about like what PHAs do that are strong and what they can do to make it better. So before, like, if you have a narrative and you see it and whatever we're reading as the reviewers at HUD, it's not a measurable goal, this is nothing measurable within the narrative, then that's not um, as well fleshed out as it could be. So as you're looking at it, take a look at the narrative. Does it explain the timeline in which you plan to implement these goals or that activity? What are the dates? Any anticipated impacts in the measurable forms? Okay, that's always helpful, that, that level of data. Um, and that, how does it connect to an MTW objective? Always wanna have to circle back. That's a core question within the supplement form, which of the objectives are being met with this goal? 
um, the activities and are, are not necessarily linked to a goal. Well, that's not good either. We, we start with, remember, what are your goals and how do we circle back to meeting that goal? So we want to make sure that it always is framed around a goal. And um, a search is backed up with logical analysis explaining it's like, how did you know this? Was there a case study that was involved? Um, did you survey out, as some of you mentioned, like, how do you know that this is, is, is something that is needed? And you can support that to the background and local need, um, or even how that that include how you included that in your considerations with your impact analysis or your hardship policy. Um, and then lastly here, what if there's, if there's no evidence of understanding associated requirements? Like, that's not great. We need to for you to in include to us the safe harbors uh, parameters in the narrative. Be very descriptive and clear about what the narrative and the description of the activity is. And so that's going to help us at HUD. It's going to help your staff, um, and it's going to help your residents. Next slide. Okay. All right. So this is these are some before um, and afters. So, we're going to give you three different before and after examples. We're going to show you examples of the kinds of things we see in submissions, have seen in submissions that have to be reworked, illustrate the kind of write up that will convey your MTW plans more clearly to the public and gain HUD's approval, as I said, probably a lot more quickly. Okay. And, you know, and I say more quickly because what you'll find is, is that once you submit these into your field office, and when I say reworked, there will likely be questions, follow-up questions, HUD comments back to your agency. This is, a, we, this is just not explaining to us well enough what the impact is, what you all are wanting to do. So, if, for example here, the triennial reexamination schedule will incentivize families to work and result in cost savings for AHA. All right, so just so you know, this is because I'm not being thorough. AHA stands for any town PHA. I know it's very unique, right? Um, but for example, with any town, any town PHA, they plan to move from annual to triennial exams. So this is this is the, the before text is accurate, but it's not very high level. It doesn't really explain to us what will be going on or why it will have the results stated. Next slide. But any town PHA got feedback from HUD and reworked the the narrative. And so let me just be clear here about this. Uh, these are designed to give you a gist, okay, of what is needed to any from any town PHA. Um, we're not suggesting to any of you that these examples are something that is 100% complete or something that you use, but definitely want to explain this to you. So um, and this understand that. It, in the after version, we are pointing out areas shaded in, in different colors that improve upon before example, approve upon the before example. Okay. So you see here, AHA has explained why the family will be incentivized, and that's in green. Okay. They will be incentivized because they will get to keep 100% of their additional earnings until their next reexamination. Um, HA also explains what the statutory objective is here in blue, which one is being met. They clearly state that it's cost effectiveness and also what the logic is for thinking that there will even be a cost savings. So this is done here in pink or lavender. And we kind of went back and forth on this before about what color that is, but it says either the logic here for thinking that is because it's going to decrease the staff time required to complete annual and interim examinations. So. That is how this will go from before and after, and this is how AHA improved from before and after. And so as you're writing your narratives, you want the it's look more like the after examples. Next slide. Okay. So, oh, we didn't have, sorry. All right, once you have selected your waivers and activities, um, it's time to move on to conducting your uh, required impact analysis when it's applicable. Okay, so when it is required, you should first complete a draft impact analysis before you post your public hearing notice. Okay, so before you start your public process, your impact analysis should have already been completed and should have already contributed to 
your narrative, your description, your thought process as to why, you know, this would help to meet your goal and what, what was overall needed to meet the goal. And um, you will also revise the impact analysis from time to time based on public comments that come back and you'll submit the final version as a part of your MTW supplement. So this is kind of like, as, as Autumn mentioned before, as you're preparing for your MTW supplement submission, this is another thing that you're going to want already ready to go, ready to be um, inserted and included within your submission prior to actually getting into the system. And uh, why it's important is that, well, I mean, for, for me, I think the impact analysis it, it helps should help your agency to really assess how effective an activity is or, or will be. And it should help identify any unintended consequences or hardships likely to affect assisted households. So getting a clear picture of those possible consequences will let you know if you need to revise any activities but to prevent any negative impacts, you know, how you can circumvent that and be proactive in advance. Um, it also will lead to maybe adding hardship policies in case of a, that negative impact. And it should also clearly explain to our, your interested parties that your PHA has considered the possible negative implications and be able to clearly explain how those possible impacts will be addressed. Okay. When we see that, we know that you've thought through it. It's strong and it is, you know, we, we're so confident that for the, its success. And again, it will lead to a quicker approval to turnaround time. Um, so some resources are also here on this slide. They go, they must give you much more in-depth detail. They're here at the bottom. Please go back and review these. Um, again, visit your MTW operations notice, which uh, it describes the requirements, the true requirements or in the operations notice um, for the impact analysis. But also here the, on the how to approach an MTW impact analysis link on the slide, is located through the online manual. And this really walks you through the impact analysis process step by step. And we urge you to please, you know, spend some time to go through that. Next slide, please. All right. So another example from AHA. All right. So uh, the MTW waiver here is allowing for an um, alternative reexam. See, PHA staff will spend only one third the amount of time processing re-examinations, which will result in substantial cost savings. There will not be any impact on households from the administrative change. Well, we certainly hope that there's no impact, but we definitely would like some more information. Remember going back to think like, well, how are you telling this? What qualitative data have you provided? So this is again, just a, a, a time that we want to, for you to dive deeper. So the before language, logical on the surface, AHA sees that the staff will only, you know, need only one third the time processing since re-exams will be triennial on now and it anticipates no impact. But it's it could be could be better. It could be better on the next slide. Okay. All right. So in order for your public to really understand, for HUD to really understand the impact of the activity and in order for us to really know that you've thought this out, the write-up has got to be in-depth. And that's what I feel like is better captured here on these next two slides, all right? And the after version points out areas shaded in different colors that improve upon the before example. And in this after version, AHA shares some of the, you know, more logical logic behind its conclusions. So HUD and the public can follow the thought process from AHA a lot more clearly. For example, the reason for the anticipated savings is specified in green. All right, very clearly. And in blue, where it says that decrease will be moderated by the need to process hardship ex exemptions for some family. All right, the nuance analysis of impacts is explained much more clearly. Um, we're, we know that the staff won't be fully reduced uh, to one third of its formal level because there will be hardship exemptions now to process. Okay, so we thought about that. Um, and also that there will be changes in family contribution, benefiting families with increased income, but also increasing AHA's cost, right? And then here in pink, there are quantifiable measures and estimates of anticipated savings and costs. 
So not just a general assertion, but very specific that AHA estimates the cost of $20,000 annually due to a delay rent increase. So very, very much more, much more specific and much more helpful. Um, and the same as far as in the below with qualitative or more in-depth reasoning about the impact on affordability of housing costs for affected families in blue. And then even on the next slide, when we talk about the impact on agencies wait lists. And I want to say like you see one, two, three, four. So there are nine factors within the impact analysis. We're going through four of these right now. But what you see here, one, two, three, four in bold, these are all of those factors and elements that you're going to be answering to. So that's why it's structured in this format. Please go to the operations notice to see. But as we we'll discuss this here on the slide, when it, it says impact on agents, agencies wait lists. So um, sometimes we just see, oh, well, it's just no impact. All right, and, and if there's no impact on the wait list, and sometimes there's not, then that's, a, of course, an acceptable response. But we want to know that you have actually researched this and can explain it to HUD why it is not. In this particular situation, it, it is, you know, fewer families may transition from the assistance in the time between the triannual reviews versus annual reviews. And this population tends to be relatively stable in their need for ongoing assistance. Uh, we've already identified it, really thought it through. Um, the next is impact on agencies termination rate. You see it says AHA anticipates that households may receive fewer termination notices for noncompliance with required documentation. So I, I think that just note that in this first year to create a measurable baseline, okay, with your data that you have access to. So that way you can reevaluate year after year if it's positive or if it's negative, regardless measured by metrics, like the nine factors that we call out here on the impact analysis. And the impact analysis, the before and afters are, are formatted, like I said, by number. So this is also a good practice when you're drafting your impact analysis documents for submissions and for upload into the MTW supplement online module is I would do it similar to this if, if it's a good practice to say like these are the non factors the question response this is how we're responding to it and I'm not asking that you color code it but definitely that you really call out the question um, each element each factor and respond thoroughly to each of those next slide please all right, so hardship policies. Okay, so preparing for your submission and developing your hardship policies, you may need uh, you may need this sometimes. You won't need to implement or prepare a hardship policy all the time. But what you, what you'll look for within Appendix One is in the safe harbor parameter box at the required safe harbors, okay? And if one of the safe harbor parameters has hardship policy, agency must implement a hardship policy with an asterisk beside it, then that lets you know that you will need to create a hardship policy for that activity, all right? Um, and this is something that we showed you before. If you'd like us to show it to you again today, that's fine. We'll, what you'll be looking for within that formatting, but definitely, um, you know, make sure that you're mindful of that each and every time because you don't want to make to complete a submission and and have the thorough narrative and description but then have left out a hardship policy and i say that but you know if in completing your impact analysis you probably then if you do if done thoroughly identify that there are potential hardships will, will, will also be a dead giveaway that even though it's maybe not a requirement but you found that there could be potentially adverse consequences to implementing these activities to some degree, and that you do want to still put a hardship policy in place. That's totally fine. Okay. But in general, um, the policy may cover also multiple activities. Okay. So what that means is you may have very similar MTW activities that you've selected. And in those situations, then what you could do is you could apply that same hardship policy to multiple NCW activities. 
So that sometimes may be perfectly fine. In other situations, you may need to tailor the hardships identified specifically to one activity. So I ask you to do so thoughtfully, thoroughly. If you feel like it is applicable to multiple activities, then that's fine. And, and also understand that this is something that you can continually, that, that can continually evolve over time. Uh, Lindsay's no longer on the call, but I'm positive that she would attest, and probably many of you, you learn from starting to do things in the beginning. You learn, oh, wow, didn't see this coming. We now need to expand our hardship policy to include X, Y, and Z. So that's totally fine. And um, it says here, like, do not parrot the MTW operations notice, right? So there are requirements as listed in the MTW operations notice for completing your hardship policy. But what we're not looking for, what we don't want to see is a copy and paste. Okay, we, we don't want to see a copy and paste because we want to make sure, again, that you are thinking thoroughly about how you implement this activity, those implications, those potential hardships, and what safeguard and measures you're putting in place to, you know, protect residents and, and yourselves. All right, so um, let's see, some big areas of weaknesses, looking at my talking points here, um, sometimes is you don't. You know, you don't have to separate your policies for every activity, but sometimes there's there's a need and we will ask about that. Right. If you if you say that you're, you know, joining that and it's all applicable, we may say, how is this actually applicable to every activity? OK, um, and we also see uh, maybe just something that's just not fleshed out enough for the hardship policy. Like, well, we don't we don't anticipate any impact. There's no hardship policy. We didn't submit one. OK, and you attach that statement that's not acceptable you do have to submit if it says a hardship policy must be conducted then or implemented by the agency then we will be looking for that and as far as well what's this example of a good hardship policy how do we begin with that if you don't already know well again here on the slide is a link you can find a sample of hardship policies in the online manual. The online manual is so amazing. I wish that, you know, uh, more people would take heed to it, take advantage of it. But luckily you're here today or you're listening on the recording and you can too go to that link and follow uh, more information to gain about the sample hardship policy. So when you complete your hardship policy, you have that documentation as well as your impact analysis. You're going to submit both of those documents as attachments to the MTW supplement module online. There are sections within the, the, the system um, that, that prompt you and ask you in a question format like, is an impact analysis or hardship policy applicable? Have you uploaded it? And then we should be able to see your upload. So those are both submitted online and um, as a, another friendly reminder, impact analysis and hardship policies, these are things that should be completed before your public hearing notice is published. The idea with the public hearing notice is that you're going out and you are telling the public what you're doing. You've already thought of these things. This is not to say that something from the public can't come back and give you an aha moment. This is, we didn't think of this. So we need to go back and circle back and update our hardship policy or impact analysis. That's totally not only acceptable, but expected. But it, you should also go prepared before your public hearing to be able to show the public um, those two documents in advance. And I, I wanna also um, circle back to a question that came in the chat earlier regarding the public hearings. Um, so with your public hearings, I think the question was asking, and Autumn, Autumn answered this, but it, it could have been my misinterpretation. But we wanted, I just wanted to be clear. So if the question was, if you have to go through your public hearing, have one hearing for the PHA plan, and then one hearing for the MTW supplement, then I think that's not the best way of looking at it. What, how we need to look at it going forward is that the PHA plan and the MTW supplement are one. So you're going through that pro public process and public hearing together. And as Autumn mentioned, if there's a, say, a special waiver, which are defined as our agency-specific waivers and safe harbor waivers, if a special waiver is also being requested through your MTW supplement, right, at that time, then that will be a separate public hearing. If I confuse anybody, let me know in the chat, but I just wanted to touch on that before I forgot. All right, all right. 
Next slide. All right, last, uh, last example here uh, for before because with the hardship policies. So um, this time on the hardship policies related to AHA's MTW waiver concerning their alternative re-exam and moving from annual to triennial, you see here that the before states that AHA will do what is required, right? They, there's no explanation of how this will be done to the public um, and or to the HUD reviewer. We have little insight into what will actually be taking place. But on the next slide, they are much more detailed. On the next slide, thank you, sorry. Um, uh, because uh, it starts with specifics about when the policy would be triggered here in green, right? It says, if family experiences a decrease in income, change of circumstances or increase in expenses that would make it difficult to pay a share of rent, then, you know, it's very, very much more specific as to the policy when that would be applied. And then it also provides specifics here in, in, in turquoise. The family can request a, a, a hardship rent, okay, sorry, the hardship rent will be provided for up to 12 months, and it goes one step further to foresee additional complications even that might arise and how they will be handled with clear specific time frames um, that's here in pink, and it says if the hardship persists, then the family can assist one or more renewals up until their next triennial reexamination. So this is just a snippet to give you an example when you're developing your hardship policies, which you'll need to do to make sure that it's thorough. Please reference here again into the, the PowerPoint, but your primary reference, your go-to, which had, needs to be saved onto your desktop or printed on your, on your you know, work desk is the MTW operations notice, okay? That's where all of the requirements are spelled out. Phew, okay. Are there any questions? about any of that. Okay. All right. Okay. I, I take that to mean that I did an exemplary job explaining it to Andalyn. But if, if anyone thinks of anything, please put it in the chat. We're, we're available here now later after, um, you know, the training is over for questions via email as well. And I will pass it over to you, Andalyn. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Crystal. The operations notice is very important. <laughs> Are we? Is that coming through? Uh, hopefully. Um, thank you so much for all of your uh, that good information. Crystal. Um, so, uh, like Crystal said, if there are any questions, please feel free to put them into chat. At this time, we're going to go ahead, next slide, and we're going to take a quick break. Let's take a 10 minute break. Um, meet back here at 332. Um, and then we'll, we'll go from there, getting into a lot uh, more uh, really good information we hope will be very valuable to you. All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome back. Hope you had a good break. Um, we're going to jump um, right back in here. But first, um, I want to do a quick poll question. Um, so, Sean, if you will, please pull up poll question number three. Let's do a quick knowledge check and, and make sure that uh, that uh, we're, we're retaining the information here. So, um, poll question number three. Three. So true or false, your draft MTW supplement, impact analysis, and hardship policies must be available for public review for at least 45 days prior to the public hearing. Is that true or false? I see a few of you have answered so far. Thank you. Lots of folks haven't answered yet, so we're gonna we're gonna keep it open for a little bit. Really want uh, participation on these polls, so please do answer. Is that true or false? Your draft MTW supplement impact analysis and hardship policies must be available for public review for at least 45 days prior to the public hearing. All right, we can go ahead and close the poll and we got no one answered incorrectly there. So um, true is the correct answer. Um, and that's right. You must have the draft MTW supplement content and all supporting materials available 
45 days prior to the public hearing. You can't post the MTW supplement for a uh, text 45 days early, um, then get the impact analysis and hardship policies posted at your leisure. The whole package should be posted together. All right. Thank you all so much. So now I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Autumn, um, who's going to go through uh, preparing for submission. And so for the next few slides, we're going to talk about preparing for the submission. Um, ultimately, you will submit your MTW supplement to HUD through um, the HIP system. And the easiest way to navigate that form, if you have all of your content all ready for it to be entered. Um, to prepare for this, use the PDF form, or as I mentioned before, the HUD 50075, the OMB approved form to guide you through um, getting ready to prepare for uh, submitting it online. As you can see in this snippet, the PDF will show you each question and you can see what the answer fields will look like. Use it to figure out what information you'll need and what format. There's a direct link on the slide, but uh, you can also find it on HUD.gov on the MTW supplement page. A few technical notes that we want to uh, bring to your attention. When preparing what you want to put in your online submission, you can use Microsoft Word. Um, please note when you copy and paste your narratives into the supplement, formatting and some other bullets um, may not show up. Um, because these the fields are plain text, think about the word file as an internal working document since only the content will appear in the system. The online MTW supplement does not have character limits, which is good. Uh, you can find information about um, how to use the system in one of our job aids. Um, they may be called something different now, but we, we have a lot of um, resource materials to help you. Uh, with the submission. We can't stress enough that you should use this form, the PDF version, to guide you and prepare you um, uh, and only log into the system to complete the supplement when you've developed your narratives and have all of your backup documentation ready to upload. And the reason that I'm saying this is that we've seen a lot of PHAs submit prematurely and it, it can just cause you a lot of headaches the system in itself, um, if you're not ready to do it it, it, it could cause frustration. So that's why we're just saying get everything ready first, uh, have your final narrative and document and waivers and, do and supporting documents, and then go into the system to submit. Next page, please. <clears throat> okay. Um, we also recommend that you You'll walk through the, the HUD form to figure out exactly what you're going to need. There are a couple of typos that we know of that uh, have been fit, fixed in the system that are listed on the how to supplement module under general help information and tips. And you can see that in the explanation. Um, you're going to want to work with your colleagues to gather information. I'll just say here asking your staff, like, what would make your your staff's life easier um, administratively, they're going to have some great ideas. They also work really close with the families, so they're going to have some really creative ideas about what you could do to make the lives of your families better. Um, you're going to want to write your narrative and other responses in the Word document um, with limiting, limited formatting, so when you're ready to copy and paste, um, it, it can go into the online system very easily. You want to gather all your supporting documents that we've talked about earlier um, as you're preparing to, to enter your text. Take all of these steps prior to beginning to complete the online system. We just, the online system isn't intuitive. There's not a back button and we're working on that. So as much as you can do outside of the system, um, It'll it'll just make your lives easier. Next slide, please. Okay, um, preparing for the in online or preparing the supplement. 
Um, we've talked about um, about the most of the attachments already, the impact analysis, the hardship policies, uh, the public comments. If you're submitting a safe harbor or agency specific waiver request, um, they'll also be submitted as attachments. So you'll have um, a, an upload a doc separate document for each one of your waivers. During the public engagement process, you'll want to develop the documents that you need to be uploaded. So you can use those documents um, with the narrative that you're going to copy and paste into the system. List all the public comments received by the public, your resident advisory board, your tenant association, along with the description of how the comments were considered. Um, that's another required document. You must also include comments and responses for all of your safe harbor and agency specific waivers. Um, and that would be in your second public um, hearing, which are held um, in addition to your original hearing. And how you analyze those comments, describing the decisions that your agency made in response to those comments. Um, we really want to know, like, we got this meaningful feedback, and this is how we kind of shifted and adjusted. And that's okay. Like, you think you have plan A, but you can, you know, plan B, C, and D based on the, the feedback that you get. Uh, finally, there is an MTW cert certification of compliance that needs to be signed, scanned, and uploaded to the form. Um, pay close attention to who needs to sign that. There is a different certificate of compliance for your PHA plan and one for your supplement. So don't forget or think that one covers both of them. An area where lots of agencies have missed is the naming conventions. Um, can you imagine we now have 100, 100 agencies and we're getting all these special waivers and they're all named random things. Um, so that's why we've created the naming conventions. Um, the supporting documents to be uploaded should follow the naming conventions. The, as you see on the screen, it'll start with the PHA code, uh, the fiscal year, the uh, name of the document, and what the document um, is in relation to. So you might have more than uh, more than one impact now, or I mean more than one hardship policy, one that attaches to one activity and one that it goes to the other. So you want to separate out those names as well. Um, like, be sure to say rent hardship or utility hardship or inspection hardship. Um, there are times that you'll use one hardship policy for all of those activities. Make sure at the top of the document that you upload, you refer to which um, activities you are using that hardship policy for, but these naming conventions are really important when you're uploading your documents and um, it makes our lives a lot easier in uh, reviewing them as well. Okay, next slide please. Okay. So, uh, something that many users have missed are the instructions to the supplement. Uh, um, and I, when I first came, I'm guilty of this. I was looking through, trying to figure out how to fill out the supplement. And I'm like, I just don't, this isn't intuitive to me. And then finally, it took me a few days when I got to the very end of the, the HUD form, there are instructions and they are very, very useful. If you go all the way to the end of, of the supplement form, you will find the instructions. They don't contain everything you need about the form, but they contain a lot of important information, such as the filing, the naming convention and information that should be included in section F. Uh, we, we have also created a reference guide, um, which is very helpful. We've, we've tried to create as many resources for you guys as possible. But this reference guide will help explain in a nutshell what you need to do um, in each section of the form. Uh, it gives very good um, guidance. And as you can see on the right hand side of the screen in, in the job aid, um, and I don't think they're called job aids anymore, job modules maybe. So I just 
want to say that you may be looking for something, instructions, guidance. Uh, the text on the online form appears um, at, with green arrows explaining what to do in the next uh, text infield box. So it'll it'll tell you in in the um, the guide what to do. You can use this document to quickly get the lay of the land uh, as you work through your your supplement form. Um, let's see. Let's go to the next slide, please. Okay. Um, here we have tips to avoid or to help avoid issues that other MTW agencies. Oh, this is not my slide. I'm going to hand this over to Crystal. I'm sorry. I, I almost took your slide, Crystal. No, it's okay. I'm not offended for one. And two, you were talking about tips. Like, yes, you go. Right? talking about the naming conventions and talking to them about the instructions that are at the end of the MTW supplement form, which are some of the best tips, some of the one of the best resources um, when preparing. But I do want to talk to you all also about some online form tips. OK, um, so to, and this is we put this here to help you avoid issues that other MTW agencies have already run into. So first regarding getting online access. OK, so when it comes to access, I would say as a best practice, we mentioned this already, but request access to the form once you're ready to begin planning. But what you can do in the interim before requesting access or before trying to get into the online system itself is print out a Word document, a Word version of the HUD 50075, which is the MTW supplement OMB approved PDF form. OK, print that out, convert it over to Word, work off of that. It's a great tool, a great, I guess, best practice, if you will, um, is to work off of that, to, to do that with your planning. And then once you have all your documentation, all of your supportive documentation in one place, then I would say, yeah, you know what, let's go ahead. We, we're, you know, we're some time out. We can see the vision, see the, see the light. Go ahead and request access. Um, another great tip is to limit staff with that that will actively use the system okay so i would say that when we say like limit your staff some known issues that we've seen as far as accessing the system would include one who turnover right so you have one staff member that has access um, perhaps you're working with a consultant you requested to have access you so when I say limit, you definitely just want to be extremely intentional about who the staff is um, and also just be aware of um, who is going to actively go into the system because user access could be um, denied if you also don't log into the system after some time. So um, only staff that will actively really use the system should be designated as the user and passwords expire after 60 days and accounts could be made inactive altogether for the PHA after 90 days. So requesting user access, just in case, like I don't wanna discourage you, but make sure you're just very intentional about who's using that, okay? And um, lastly, I would say for the executive director for the ED, um, you know, it, when requesting access, you are going to need to fill out documentation to do so. So that can be found on the MTW supplement webpage. Um, and also on the link that you see here on the slide with the HIP system training page. So once you draft the form and supporting documents that are prepared, you're going to want to, again, start to request access. You should reference the housing information portal MTW supplement module for PHA users. You'll see on this HIP system training page, there's a ton of resources, uh, but, but one of those includes how to gain access to the system from here. So that's what you'll be looking for directly from this page, instructions on how to do so. And I would say also, this is also really good one to bookmark, okay? The HIP system training page. It's gonna give you other resources for PHA users. It's gonna give you documentation on like known issues for PHA users, known issues that have already occurred with the system that could potentially save you a lot of time. I'm going forward as you are, you know, trying to go ahead and submit your online form. Next slide. Okay. All right. So lots of individuals sometimes get tripped up 
on this page. This is ironically the first page, right? But th this can be kind of um, it, it looks, I want to say confusing, but it seems like sometimes you, you don't have to do a lot in this section because a lot of the information is pre-populated. You see kind of like a grayed out area versus, you know, white, more structured, white and dense areas. So um, in this section, one of the things I would just make you mindful of is for the year for supplement fiscal year beginning, we're wanting you to really pay attention here. Like, when are you planning on getting started with fiscal year? Like, be mindful of that. Let us know. Also, with the submission type, we're looking for very spe specifics here. The, the drop down options and for the year will be from 2024 down for the fiscal years. Um, however, and, and actually maybe before then, if you were doing something to a formerly submitted version, which you guys don't have, so forget that. But it's going to be from 2024 down is what you would be selecting for the fiscal year beginning um, and then for the submission type you'll see it will read is it going to say uh, an, 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 an annual admission is it an amendment which we talked about earl earlier as to the pha plan but when you're first starting you're going to just put your annual submission there is what we're looking for but that's how we track so you'll see even in, in your tracking and when you're looking on the online system, you'll see several times where it's, it will specify if it's an annual submission or if there's an amendment, and that's the type of submission type options that we'll be looking for there. Yeah. And um, let me see, make sure I'm not missing anything. Oh, this is an example here. All right, so if your fiscal year 2024 started, let's say October 1, 23, then you would select fiscal year 2023 and if it's begin um, in, in that in that field. So, I mean, I, I feel like everyone knows when your fiscal year begins. So, but I just wanted to give you that example here. All right, next slide. Okay. All right, gaining has approval. So, um, I would say Here's another batch of tips to avoid some of those common mistakes. Uh, this time, let's focus on the uh, approval process though after you submitted your online submission. So um, one of the things is like, if there's no use of waivers, okay, you just have to understand there's, you cannot use the waivers until you have an MTW supplement that is approved. Um, another thing here is um, we will, email you concerns and corrections um, if we as we find things uh, and that approval sometimes may come in several parts if you will especially in situation where there's a agency specific or safe harbor waiver that's attached to the request you can definitely plan on several back and forths and communications uh, with hud and your agency and uh understanding too like we mentioned before the more thought out your narratives are, your impact analysis, your hardship policies, your naming conventions, as Autumn mentioned, is, will also help to gain HUD approval more quickly. And we're also looking for um, if the, the PHA plan, okay, that's very important, right? Because we will not approve an MTW supplement if a PHA plan has not also been submitted. That's traveling through two different avenues, two different channels are recognized with the PH portal versus an NTW supplement. So make sure you're communicating that circle back with your field office. Hey, confirm receipt for both of these, um, that these are both submitted, please. And um, also that PHAs should respond to comments within a timely manner. And we understand sometimes life happens right we all get busy i know you all are busy so just that consistent transparency between hud and your phas i think will still make a ton of difference and if you have any questions issue those to us in writing as well let us know what what you're seeking if there's any gaps in understanding or knowledge to help you to gain that hud approval because we're definitely still here to help and um any revisions to the content in the MTW supplement must be done in the online system. 
So again, that will also lead to some of that back and forth. The form's going to need to be returned for revision in the system back to you before you can make edits, um, conveying the need and, re to, and requesting that from HUD is still necessary for you to do that. And those revisions, we're looking before you talk about a final approval, we want to make sure that your MTW supplement submission is clearly depicting the latest and greatest, uh, you know, requirements or agreed upon terms, because sometimes we said, like, maybe there's a before and there's an after narrative, or maybe there was more clarity that was made to the impact analysis. You know, so if there, any of those changes were to occur, then the form would then be returned for revision back to the PHA. Those changes would be corrected and, you know, those revisions would then need to show online in the system. Um, and then potentially even any other out of date documents would need to be removed first. So all of these types of things are going to be what is needed to gain an official HUD approval. Next slide. Okay. All right. So, oh, let's jump in. All right. So to submit a revised MTW supplement. All right. So if we request for a revision, um, I would say begin by discussing with your field office if you have any questions first and foremost. Follow the whatever instructions that the field office gives for you to update MTW supplement. Please try to just adhere to the, that request. Um, the form, like I said, it will need to be returned for revision in order for you to actually make any edits. And when it comes to some of those edits, remember we talked about the HIP system training page. There's a file that says how to use the system for instructions on how to revise or how to delete a file that is no, like I said, out of date, no longer applicable. So th that resource, lot and other resources on that page. And then um, also I would say just a note, the online MTW supplement form is continuing to evolve. So in the future, you may need to check the MTW supplement page, right, again, to just find updated documents. Um, also check the HIP system training page constantly because, for example, those known issues, those are constantly being updated constantly. So uh, that said, you know, just for the latest and greatest information, come visit us. OK, <laughs> and and then finally, uh, remember that you must update your ACOP and or admin plan to be consistent with your MTW activities and related waivers. So you cannot implement the MTW activity or a waiver until all the relevant sections of the ACOP and admin plan are updated. Um, you also, to reiterate above, you cannot implement a waiver or any anything with your MTW supplement as it related to what you submitted in your form without an official approval letter also. So uh, let me see. Uh, next slide. Oh. Okay. Are, are there any questions? All right. We actually do have a couple of questions in the chat. So okay. I'm going to start with those. And then if you want to, uh, anyone wants to put questions in chat or just come off mute, then just let me know. Um, so we have a question. Um, I sent an uh, invite letter to form uh, a RAB. We have four volunteers so far. Our agency has a BA for 220 vouchers. Is this RAB size big enough for MTW standards? <laughs> I might phone a friend. Autumn is a, has a lot of experience having worked in a field office and a PHA. You know, so is this subjective to this activity? I mean, first of all, kudos to you for beginning it because can't tell you how many times we ran into individuals saying we do not have a resident advisory board. So, Autumn? Um, I am going to look up the PHA plan uh, requirements, um, but I think you're okay. Uh, you know, you may want to reach out and say, hey, you've been a great tenant. We'd love for you to be on it and offer it to some other people. Um, do you have both public housing and HCV? You'd want a, a good mix for that. Sorry, camera, sorry. Brittany, you want to call? Yeah. Sorry, I didn't know you were asking the question. <laughs> um, yes, we 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 only have housing choice vouchers. We don't have any um, uh, public okay. housing. Yeah. Yeah. So, 
like Crystal said, congratulations. Um, I am going to look up the, the regulations. I don't think there is a size requirement, but I will confirm before we finish today. Thank you. Yeah, it was, I was happy to see that we did have some volunteers, but that was kind of my next step is just reaching out to those that I know have expressed interest in just being involved in some way. So uh, that's what I'll probably do. Great. All right. We have another question here um, just about trying to access the link that, that was sent to you earlier today. You guys have this, um, this uh, slide deck. Um, so you have access to all the links, which is a wonderful thing. Um, and so thank you, Kelly. Um, I've asked since I saw your message, I've tried a couple of times too, and I'm getting an uh, error message. Um, but if some people are getting error messages and some people are not, so I'm not sure what's going on there. Um, but that is the, the page. Um, and okay. if it's down, I'm, I'll probably restart my computer after this. And um, if you have any questions or are still getting an error after maybe you restart or maybe this evening, um, then please reach out. Um, there's an MTW Flexibility 2 cohort website that we're going to put up in a moment, and um, I'm sure we can lead you to it. Okay, thank you so much. Does anybody else, we're, we're almost at time, but I want to make sure we get your questions answered. That's that's most important. Anybody else want to come off of you, AB, or put a question in chat? Okay, so I have one more question for you and it's a really important question. So before you log off, um, Sean, please pull up poll question number four. Our very next session is going to be in office hours on August 22nd and we want to hear from you about what topics, questions, heartburn you're having, um, what topics you feel are going to be best um, to help um, with the office hours. So Sean, if you could pull up poll question number four. And this poll question should come up in a moment. And we're going to um, it has all of the different uh, topic areas. Um, okay, so I'm getting word that our poll isn't loading. So if you could just put into chat any other questions that you have or, or not specific, you know, any topic areas that you think we should cover, anything that would be useful for you to hear about in the office hours. We want to make sure that we um, are tailoring that to, to help you the best way. While you're putting those questions in the chat, I'm going to move on. Uh, next slide, please, to the resources page. I won't go through all of these um, individually, but we do have uh, system guidance. Um, so there's the HIP system. Thank you, Kelly, for putting that into the uh, additional information on gaining access to HIP and how to support our EDs. Wonderful. Um, into the, the chat. Um, so hopefully that system training page will come back up, but if, if it doesn't, then just let us know. Um, the MTW supplement web-based form. We have other supplement resources really detailed guidance for completing the MTW supplement. And we're, you know, referencing the appendixes, appendix one um, that talks to waiver, uh, waivers and appendix two um, to safe harbors. Um, and then next slide, we have lots more resources for you, references and training, um, information on impact analysis of hardship policies and some voices of experience um, that you can just uh, watch and or listen to. So we hope that that is really helpful to you. Um, so go to the next slide, please. Um, we ran a little bit over time, but again, our next office hours is August 22nd um, from two to four. And um, there's the MTW flexibility two at HUD.gov. Please uh, do reach out if you think of anything to let us know what you would like to see in the office hours. Uh, we would love to hear from you. And with that, I'll say thank you so much to, to HUD and Lindsay is not on the phone anymore, um, but uh, she, she want to thank her as well. And, uh, and that's it. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day.